Hello Kimberly, thanks for being with us again today. Can you introduce yourself for our new viewers? I'm Kimberly Nicholas. I'm a professor of sustainability science at Lund University, and I'm the author of Under the Sky We Make. A new IPCC report has just been published. The last report, August 2021, stated that climate change is undeniable. Can you give us an overview of the new report, February 2022, and its main findings? Yes. Well, what we need to know about climate change is basically it's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, we can fix it. And IPCC divides this into three working groups. So working group one, which came out with the latest report in August 2021, deals with the first three aspects. It's warming, it's us, we're sure. As you said, the takeaway there was human caused climate warming is unequivocal. We know for a fact that it's happening primarily from burning fossil fuels. The second report, uh, which came out uh, about a month ago now, the spring of 2022, deals with it's bad. And there'll be a, a third IPCC report coming out in, in early April of 2022, which is about we can fix it. So this working group two report, the, the it's bad report basically said, we have a narrow window of securing a livable future on earth. It was really very stark. And that's both for people and for nature. It really emphasized the difference that basically the difference between limiting global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees is the difference between life and death for people in places around the world. And that if we don't manage to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, if we overshoot that, that limit, even if we later manage to remove carbon from the atmosphere, which is not an easy task, and, and return to 1.5, that there will be irreparable damage. So it was really quite stark that already the impacts are being felt by people in places around the world and um, climate adaptation or preparing for and, and building resilience to climate impacts is possible, but is not being done well enough, fast enough. There's not enough investment in it. The most vulnerable are the most at risk. And in, now we have, unfortunately, evidence that maladaptation is happening. So intending to, to adapt to climate change can sometimes unintentionally worsen the problem, like building seawalls that then uh, actually aren't effective and aren't a good solution for rising seas. Since the IPCC report focuses on impacts on people and nature, can you explain what it says about climate adaption and what this means? Sure. So when it comes to climate change, humanity basically has three options. We can prevent, prepare, or suffer. And the more time goes by, the worse our options get. So definitely the best and most important and urgent thing is to prevent further climate change from happening. And the way that we do that is by leaving fossil fuels in the ground. We have to transition to a fossil-free society in a fast and fair way. We do also at the same time need to prepare for the changes that are already here and those that cannot be avoided. And that's where climate adaptation come in, comes in. So that's adjusting to new climate realities and strengthening communities and ecosystems to deal with increasing, for example, climate extremes. And the reason that those two things are so important is that what's left over is suffering. So that is more technically called loss and damage. That's changes that can't be avoided and can't be adapted to. And this latest report was really clear that there are a lot of those things that it is not possible to adapt even to the little over one degree of warming that we've experienced already. It's not possible to fully adapt entirely to that much warming. And if we, that's why it's so urgent that we actually succeed in making this transition happen and stopping warming because the more warming we have, the, the more options we lose for actually being able to cope with a new climate. How do we adapt to climate change in the global north versus the global south? Climate change is really unfair, and this report made that really clear with many more examples that disproportionately, it's those of us who live in the global north, in Europe and North America primarily, who have emitted most of the greenhouse gases and caused most of the warming. And while even we see impacts today and are already seeing our daily lives affected by climate change, those impacts are much worse and there's much less capacity to cope with those impacts in uh, lower latitude countries, primarily in the global south and in lower income and poor countries. 
And this report made really clear that there's about half of the world's population, so up to 3.6 billion people, who are at risk of climate impacts. So many of them in already vulnerable situations along low-lying coasts or low-lying island nations, in informal settlements, uh, often women and other marginalized groups in society. So there's definitely a huge justice angle to climate adaptation. And, and the report made really clear that it's government responsibility to pay our fair share, especially from rich northern countries, to prepare our own citizens and our own countries for climate change and also to help others prepare and adapt. And the governments going first will help unlock private funding as well. But we just need much more investment in climate adaptation as well as in reducing emissions in the first place. As a sustainability researcher, you work with the issue of climate change on a daily basis. How do you react to these findings? It's time to be alarmed. Everyone should be alarmed. We are not doing enough about the climate crisis and we alarm is appropriate. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that we can't just be alarmed. We have to turn alarm into action and we need ways of actually emotionally coping with the overwhelming impacts of the climate crisis, especially for people who are just waking up to it now, it can feel very overwhelming. So it's really important to handle, I mean, I talk about facing the climate crisis with facts, feelings, and action. That's, I think, the, the secret sauce of how we can actually solve this problem is we need to use the evidence and the facts like the IPCC provides us. And I cite and summarize the IPCC in, in my work in public communication on, on Twitter and on Instagram and in my book and newsletter. So we need those facts. We need ways of emotionally handling them and coping with being alive at this really existentially challenging time. And we urgently need to translate all that concern and alarm into action. And basically what we need to do is leave fossil fuels in the ground and have a food system that works with instead of against nature. Those are the two fundamental challenges we have to solve mostly in the next 88 months or so if we're going to stop catastrophic climate change. So. We really need people to understand and appreciate that and the scale of the urgency. We need to be reducing emissions about 1% per month in countries like in Europe and in North America. So that's the main job right now. If you're you know, alive at this point on, in the history of humanity and planet Earth, that's really your main job and everything else needs to kind of line up behind that and, and prioritizing a good life for people and the 8 million species that we share the planet with really depends on us solving this problem. So we have the solutions, we know what to do, they are ready, science has done our job and we're now trying to mobilize people to actually implement them because that's what will make the critical difference. What can we and our viewers do to respond to this alarming message? That's really where I focus most of my work, so I would love to Uh, have you read more about that? I mean, I have a monthly climate advice newsletter called We Can Fix It over on Substack, which is free, and you're very welcome to check that out. And the archive is full of ideas about how do I build a climate community? How do I talk about climate change? How do I cope with you know, climate grief and loss or these feelings of pre-fire dread like my friends in California face worrying about another devastating fire season? So It has the facts, it has the summaries of the latest reports and the newest evidence and what it means for you. And it also has every month really concrete, actionable, evidence-based advice on what it is you can do. So, you know, recently we published a study showing these five high impact areas for climate action from those of us in the global top 10%. We are really the critical group that I think that will determine the climate future for essentially forever, since carbon essentially lasts forever in our atmosphere. And that means if you earn above about $38,000 a year or more, which is you know below the median income here in Sweden, so that's most people in Sweden, for example, you are in the global elite. You live in a democracy, you have power as a citizen, as a part of schools and organizations, as a role model for others, which we know makes a big difference. Uh, and in your own daily consumption and lifestyle choices. So there are really a lot of roles that we can play and we know the high impact actions there. So I think people, it's about matching your interests and abilities and skills with where you are and what you get joy and enjoy doing so that you can sustain that work. <laughs>